Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker, and I grew up watching As the World Turns and Guiding Light. I joined the PR department there in 1997 and remained working on both shows for 13 years. As I was stuck here in quarantine, I realized that I was missing my Oakdale family and thought some of you might be feeling the same way as I. And today we have a great As the World Turns show for you. We have three actors here today who have left indelible uh, who played indelible characters in the Oakdale landscape. We have Scott Bryce, who played Craig Montgomery, Greg Marks, who played Tom Hughes, and Hilary B. Smith, who played Margaret Hughes. Let's get started. Scott. Hi, Hilary. Greg. <clears throat> hey, everybody. Hi. Hi. Uh, Thanks hey, for uh, joining me today. Thanks for so having me. Happy her. to be here. I'm here for these two. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, everybody, uh, each one of you, as I reached out to the other, was quite excited to see this three together. We were um, we were kind of inseparable during our times together. I mean, literally inseparable. I think Lisa Brown kind of made up our foursome for a while there, but um, really it was just, you know, just giggled and laughed our way through um, just about every day. Our AM PMS. Yeah. It was a, it was actually a really joyous time. I mean, you know, I think back on it. I don't even think we knew how lucky we were, you know, to be doing what we were doing, making the money we were making, and having the fun that we were having. Yeah, yeah. That's, exactly no, that's, that's right. absolutely true, Scott. Yeah, the show the show was uh, kicking it. Uh -oh. in the, you know, the show was kicking it at that time. It, it was. It really was yeah. a great, Doug great story. Really, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Bob Calhoun and Doug Marland. Yeah. Yeah. Love both those it was, men. They were Amazing. Awesome. Yeah, they were awesome. They really, they really, uh, it was very interactive. That's the one thing I've always said about Doug Marlin is that he always was very attuned to who his actors were. And he, if you ever went to his house, you saw his, he had a typewriter, not electric, a typewriter. <laughs> And above, and he sat in the littlest room of his house, off his kitchen. And above it were all of our um, eight by tens, tens pictures. Yeah, and we were oh, his wow. family. And he wrote, he 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 watched the show, and he watched you, and he wrote things. It was so interesting how he took like Barbara, and he turned her character into a completely different character, and it was so beautifully done and it just it launched that character into a whole nother realm of you know uh, and, telling, yeah. and he redeemed he my evil character you know and created that romance and told me he would he was like you know if you stay i was thinking about leaving he goes if you stay i'll rewrite you i'll turn you into a hero and i'll guarantee you get a nominated for a best actor and i did they all came true he was a remarkable storyteller he understood mm -hmm. romance yeah. And it was a time in the in the show when it was people over plot. Plot was almost meaningless. Yeah. It, was real, it, it really ever happened. I remember he called me one time and said, I want to initiate some. We knew Greg was leaving at that point, which was um, breaking all of our hearts. And he said, I want to initiate something between you and Hal, something of romance between you and Hal. And because I've seen you guys work together and I can see there's a little spark going on there. And I'd like to, you know, kind of flush that out in some way, not not to threaten Margo and Tom, but just to add a little intrigue. And, in, you know, since Scott's leaving, I mean, um, Greg's leaving. And so he asked me, what would it take for you to, you know, fall into bed with him? And I said, well, I'd have to be drunk because she's so in love with Tom. So it was very interesting because he gave me that opportunity to have had too much and Hal has to bring me home from a party and then he goes to tuck me in and this is now the character of Tom has, has left me and he goes to tuck me in and we just sit there and we look at each other and it's one of those moments that it almost happens but it doesn't. 
because Doug knew, can't let it happen. She's still married. The fans are still invested, but we've planted the seed. I mean, it was just. More than the seed. He, he put on a giant chum of bait yeah. to the audience. <laughs> you know, every time he knew what he was doing. He really yeah. did. Well, you know, um, I, I had Scott and Ellen on um, and told them, which I had did not know this, Tom and Margo is the longest um, couple in daytime history, married. Oh, wow. 27, really? I think 27 years, the characters of Margo and Tom have, are the longest couple that have been together. So you were a part of a incredible history there. Um, do, you remember, do you remember your screen test? Oh, yes. 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 Greg, you, <laughs> Greg said, oh, yes, first. So let, you go first, Greg. Uh, I was terrified. Terrified. Um, who, who, was it, who was it with? It wasn't me. It wasn't Hillary. Who was it with? I, I don't think you had one, did you? No, what happened was I was in New York. I didn't even... I was visiting friends and I had a, what I thought was a general audition and it was for Phil, uh, with uh, Vince Leopard and Phyllis Kasha. And they had me read these sides and thank you. And I left and I literally called my agent from 50th and Broadway from a pay phone. That's how long ago. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I say, he said, how did it go? And I said, I think good. He said, yeah, it did because they, they're coming to LA to test you. I said, for what? <laughs> and then he told me. Um, and two weeks later, I tested on the set of um, Young and the Restless, actually, CBS, uh, Television City, but I don't remember who I tested with. That's terrible. So but then do you remember the first time you met Hillary? I, oh, absolutely. I, I called Hillary and said, hi, I'm your new husband, and <laughs> um, I want to take you out for dinner. And so she said, great. And we, Hillary, tell me if you think I'm wrong, but... It was instantaneous. Instantaneous. It was like, I recognize you from another life. I don't know. It was right away. Our dynamic was perfect. And that's a gift for an actor. Yeah. You know? um, we didn't have to work to find the connection. And, no. um, that was joyful. Yeah. You really can't create chemistry. It's no. there or it's not. Unless you're a chemist. Right, no, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Hillary, it, has, do you, it has to be there. It has to be there, and it was there in spades. Do you do you remember your Hillary, your screen test? Oh, yeah, oh yes, I do. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my screen test, and then I remember my first day of work, which is very interesting. So my screen test was with Justin Dees, and I oh, think wow. okay. Mercedes Rule was also screen testing, and Dana Delaney was also screen testing. Didn't hurt them any, they didn't get the part. So let's not cry over that. Um, but I remember that uh, Justin was not happy that Mar that the character of Margo was no longer being played by Margaret Collin. And he wasn't making it easy for them to recast. So basically it was whoever could hold their own got the part. And I was wearing a very short flouncy skirt dress and my hair was long and I had high heels on and I just remember him like trying to flip me upside down and I was like okay well thank god I'm wearing clean underwear that's all I could wear <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of went with it. I mean, there was one girl that back there she was so angry she goes what kind of a? I was like you know what you gotta just <laughs> and so that's how I got the part but my first day of work I arrived and I was newly engaged I had just, it was 1983, and I had just gotten engaged, and I showed up at the set, and I meet Scott Bryce, and Scotty is, and I, uh, instantaneous, at which point he goes, so, my sister, huh, and he grabs me and then dips me in this tango dip and goes, where have you been all my life? <laughs> and I literally went, I just got engaged. <laughs> Wow, he's so <clears throat> cute. But um, we've been best friends. She later learned that that's how I said good morning to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, special. Nothing special. I think one of the directors really liked that, actually. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and then my, I guess my screw does, I, I, I auditioned for the part of um, Josh on Guiding Light. Uh, oh, wow. Like months Robert earlier. Newman. Like Robert, Robert, Robert Newman. Newman. And it was just oh, wow. Robert Newman and I auditioning for it. And I made a joke with Robert because I said, Hi, I'm Scott Bryce. I said, Hi. And I put out my hand. He goes, Hi, Robert Newman. And I said, Hi, Paul Redford. <laughs> and I was oh. trying, to make, <laughs> trying to make a joke and I don't think he yeah. got it, but Didn't he's a great it. guy. And he got the part and thank God he did. He's an amazing actor and it was his role to be had. And a couple of months later, yeah, I get the same it. same for you because I really couldn't see. Thing right, I mean, things happen the way they're supposed yeah, to sometimes. Totally. I think so. I get a call in for Betty Ray, and I was I was waiting tables all night long, like four in the morning, and I have to go into Betty, and it's like nine thirty, and Betty's looking up at the TV monitor. She doesn't even look at me, and she's just sort of reading the 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 lines of the other actor, and I'm not even making eye contact. And about halfway through, my very young, tumultuous, ego driven, naive actor boy decides maybe I should just stop because obviously she's not paying attention to me and this is wrong. But I stuck it out and I finished the scene in my little arrogant way and she's still looking at the TV monitor. She goes, you look like hell, go home and get some sleep. Your screen test will be Wednesday. And I thought, like Betty Ray. Oh my God, I didn't stop. <laughs> I would have lost this job. And that part wound up being the break of my career. So wow. very grateful. Do you remember your first day? Uh, yes, I was terrified. Um, I was terrified even on the first day. And what helped me, actually, they really didn't know what they were doing with the character. I came in from this, uh, like, I had stolen secrets from the KGB, and I had this pheromone perfume idea, and I was from this, like, I was from Martinique. And so I was wearing this like mustard yellow. I was like not the ca same character like at all that you would even know. I was terrified. I remember I had to get up off the couch and go answer the door. And the cameraman, the late uh, Pat Finn, wonderful, amazing guy. And Pat knew my dad from Guiding Light. And so we do the scene a couple of times and the, actor, the director's giving me notes. And Pat comes over and he goes, you know, you're doing like a 50 yard dash to the door. I can't keep up with you. Okay. Let me get a little hint before you get up. Just give a little indication. You're going to get up. That helps the cameraman Then I can go with you over to the door and take your time. It's all about you being on screen. Don't rush anything. By the way, your dad was a great guy. <laughs> and my shoulders dropped and I breathed and I relaxed and I got through that first scene and then the character evolved into what it became, which was Pretty amazing. I was able to do a lot of stuff. Very well, there was, a, there was a, a quintessential moment in the character of of um, Scott's character, Craig. Wow. Sorry, I haven't <laughs> said that for a long time. Um, Jody says I have some timers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. I, I like that one. And that's when um, when you had been faking your your paralysis with um, yeah, with and I had to rescue you from the burning house. You rescued me from the burning house, uh, which of course they went and they they backed out after doing all the rubber cement, and then went to go light it, and realizing that we were going to be in, in the middle of an explosion. Yes, remember that, <laughs> Scott? You saved our lives. That's all I'll say. <laughs> anyway, yeah, special defects. Yeah, but special it, defects. Special defects. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, Hell, That was good. Okay. <laughs> it's when Annie Sword Hansen, who played our mother, found oh. out that you'd been lying to her, and <laughs> and she slapped you across the face. It was such a moment. It was such a moment. It was all character driven. It was just beautiful. Hmm. Well, speaking of her, talk talk about Annie Sword. She's um, living in Utah. And she brought actually Screen Actors Guild to Utah, which has been uh, great for actors. And she upgraded contracts out there and she's been active in developing the shooting world out there. And I, I love her like my second mother. I mean, you know, I think Annie is actually two years younger than I am, but that's television. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite. Not quite, but you but know. we both were pregnant at the same time. Yes, that's right. right. You, so, you and she were? Yeah. yeah. So oh, she wow. was playing my mother, and my mother and I were pregnant at the same time. We both had children, and then we both used our children on the on the show. Whose was Annie's? I know who yours was. Do you remember whose? Annie's was what? What, did, what was the name of her character? Lila. Lila. No, 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 no Lila's baby's character. It was when she was married to um, Casey. To Casey. Casey. 
Oh, okay. I don't remember Billy. what they had. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I just I just watched the opening of the Mona, Mona Lisa where she's belting it out. Oh my God, wow. her voice was her voice was so great. Mm-hmm. So who or what was the biggest the Almond Brothers? Did you oh, know she that? did? She yeah. sang back up for the Almond Brothers. I didn't know oh. that. Yeah, in the studios. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Wow. And she oh, thinks wow. she'd get a call at three o'clock in the morning. Okay, it's time. Greg wants to work. And off she'd go to the studio <laughs> and <laughs> do her thing. Well, well, we might have to do another one and, and get her to join you guys at some point. Because I have Absolutely. Fans, Absolutely. Would love to, fans would love to see her. I, I didn't have a way to contact her. So who or what was um, the biggest influence on you three becoming actors? Hillary? Oh, hmm. God, I, I just think I always wanted to be one. I don't think anyone, I think there was more influence to try and get me to stop wanting to be one than there was one <laughs> promoting me. I, am, I know that my, um, I just wanted to be on a soap opera. And I think I told this story about David O'Brien. Yeah. yeah um, I, you know, just always wanted to be one. You just knew. Yeah, some people know. Scott? Uh, I grew up in the business, and so I hated it. And I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And uh, then I was taking a tour from ninth grade to 10th grade. We went to to go to the high school tour. And we got to the stage, uh, which is huge. The Staples Auditorium is 1,400 seats. And so I'm with this group of 30 people, and 29 of them move on. I'm left alone on stage. And a voice from the back of the theater, the late, great Al Pia, who was my drama teacher and the creator of the, not the creator, but uh, director of the Staples Players, and if you want to get mind boggled, just Google Staples Players alumni, because it's like Christopher Lloyd on. I mean, it's an unbelievable amount of actors. And so this voice I can't even see says, I'm looking up at the flies, and I hear this voice, feel like you're home? And I look out at this nothing, vast black, and I went, yeah. And he said, good, you're the lead in the next play. I'll send the script to your house. <laughs> Wow. That was my first audition, and it was the brick in the rose. I played Tommy, and we won all state competition, that's- and that was it. And then I couldn't – once it was – it's the bug. I mean, it's there's no other way to explain it. You get that taste of it, and if it's right for you, and when you find also yourself with that community, theater is an incredible community. And many of us are broken-winged people who come together to heal each other, and that's part of our experience. Um, but once you're in that community – how do you turn back? How do you, how do I, I couldn't, I was like, I'm going to work for a corporation. I, I, I can't, I'm having too much fun with Hillary and Greg. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and as, and as, you know, I will tell you this story though. I, I did a play called the ruling class where I played a paranoid schizophrenic who thinks he's Jesus Christ. And it's my junior year. Well, I worked with him. And I was, <laughs> <laughs> On opening night, my parents come backstage and they were incredibly somber. And that the, the play was an enormous monster hit. The playwright came, Peter Barnes. And uh, mm-hmm. so I was thinking something's up. I looked at my dad, I said, was I okay? And my father goes, you were brilliant. We'll see it all. And I go to the cast party and I'm thinking one of my brothers is in trouble or there's something gone horribly wrong. And I went home and I opened up the door and I walked in the house and my mother was sobbing uncontrollably on the couch and my father's trying to console her. And I said, what happened? And my mom looks up and goes, we know you're an actor. <laughs> and both my parents were actors. And yeah. she said, now we can't protect you from the pain. Yeah. You know? Wow. What about you, Greg? Yeah. Um, I, it came to me late, actually. I mean, because uh, I was going to be I was uh, going to be a lawyer. I was going to go to law school. I was pre-law at UCLA. and. Thank God came to my senses before. (laughs) But it was more an evolutionary thing for me. Um, And and for me, because of the family ties, um, there was, once I sort of started entertaining the idea, then it kind of got daunting. It's like, oh, I've got this name to live up to or to measure up to or something. And so... Um, that was something I struggled with for a really long time, actually, <laughs> um, to the extent that I was going to change it. Wow. So my father would have disowned me. Um, but yeah, so it, it was more for me, it was kind of like, oh, I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to be Perry Mason. Oh, OK. Um, so it kind of it, it evolved for me. Hmm. But, Did you see HBO's doing a Perry Mason? 
<laughs> I did. Speaking, they are. Speak, yeah, I'm with um, Mason every with, night. Um, Re, uh, Matthew Reese. Mike Matthew Reese, who I love. Yeah, he's and wonderful. As someone else, uh, a woman I can't think off the top of my head. Jealous I'm, Street. I'm a woman. It's a woman. Yeah. Oh, Tatiana Maslany. Is from, that who it is? Yes, okay. Tatiana Maslany. She's yeah. amazing. I love. Her. Did you watch Orphan Black? <clears throat> of course. <laughs> That was phenomenal. Um, can you all three? Well, first I was going to ask because a fan, Trey, wrote, do you know what Margot and Tom's song was? Uh, well, I had four Toms. So. <laughs> <laughs> you brazen hussy. Which couple? <laughs> if, if you say my eyes are beautiful, one oh. of the fans wrote. It was. Yeah. Uh, that was, um, what's his name? The. Um... <clears throat> Yeah, I know Jack, you're, right? I don't know off the top of my head, but I know. I think I it was Jim. Oh wow! Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I was gonna um, say, what am I reading? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> oh, but it was it was for you, Hillary. It said, "Can you share memories of working on the Doctors in 1982 before World Turns?" Oh my gosh! Um, yes. Um, talk about fun. Um, I was working with Alec Baldwin and uh, Jada, Ro Jada Rowland and uh, Kim Zimmer's last day was my first day. And um, mm. we, we just had a ball there, but it was, we, we knew it was kind of going off the air, which was sort of too bad. And we had cue cards and we um, actually um, dared each other. And at one point we had these stupid scenes and we dared each other not to learn the lines and to only use the cue cards, but not <laughs> <laughs> and wow. I don't know whether any of you saw um, Tootsie with uh, Dustin Hoffman. Which, yes. <laughs> when, when she takes the, look at me, look at me. That was actually um, an actor who shot a remaining with on the doctors, never looked at you. But he was brilliant. He only looked at the cue cards, and he looked at the cue cards with great intensity. <laughs> and that's how he delivered his lines. Like, card. So he never got caught reading the cue card. He just played every scene to the to cue the card. card. <laughs> that's hysterical. <laughs> um, back to the song for one second. It was Whitney Houston and Jermaine Jackson. Ah. And oh, Hillary well, and Whitney yeah. came and sang. She, she did. Whitney came and sang. Right. Mm -hmm. Whitney, I forgot, Whitney did. And didn't you room, roommate with uh, Alec Baldwin? Wasn't he your roommate? Didn't you share yeah. that the last time? Yeah, uh, yes. When when the show went off the air, Tuck uh, Milligan and, um, and Alec and I went and we shared an apartment out in Los Angeles. And um, then my, my boyfriend, my husband now, my boyfriend at the time came out and we thought it was hysterical. We were gonna start a plastic surgery law firm Bailey Baldwin, nip and tuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yes. That's hysterical. You know, Hillary um, and I were roommates for a while, too. Yes, we were. Oh, oh wait, awesome. Scott, tell the story about, I'm sorry, Greg, uh, bear with us. Tell the story about something wilder. Well, I, I, I was very honored. Uh, Hillary was doing, talk about, okay, this is the kind of actress and person that Hillary Billy Smith is. Understand, she was doing a primetime series in Los Angeles while simultaneously doing a daytime soap opera in New York. So she would work on the, on the Something Wilder show with Gene Wilder playing opposite him, co-starring. And then they would tape that night and then she'd fly home either on the red eye or the next morning. Next then morning. Shoot, next morning, then shoot all of her scenes on Monday, then fly back and get back to work on Tuesday in Los Angeles. It was actually extraordinarily impressive. Anyway, I think it was Barnett Kellman was the director, and Barnett had worked with us on As the World Turns as well. So I got the great chance to play um, Hillary's ex-boyfriend from the past who comes back to visit, and is. Gene is very threatened by. He even has a, a nightmare where I walk right into the kitchen on a white horse and I literally go to the kitchen. <laughs> and so there comes this moment where Hillary and I have to kiss in this scene because it's going to be, you know, this romantic, incredible kiss. And it comes to the kiss and 
we kind of look at each other and first I turned this way and then our heads bumped and then our noses <laughs> got awkward. It was the most awkward, awful, horrible kiss. And finally, Hillary looks over at Barnett and goes, it's my brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, also remember we're sharing an apartment out in Los Angeles together. Yes, yes. So when I go out there, he's my roommate. So now I've got my roommate who's my brother and we're supposed to have a mad passion. It literally got down to, okay, you turn your head to the right, I'll turn I'll my head left. to the right and work it. <laughs> and I so, love you, but it was still the most awkward kiss I think I ever had. Awkward, yes. terrible, terrible. <laughs> that is fantastic. Um, Hillary, Rob, one of our fans said, I have Hillary's personal script from the last day of days. He has, uh, from, the, from the last day of the doctors. Oh, wow. Somebody has your uh, script. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's I don't know 1982. Where, yeah, I don't know where he where Rob got well, it, but he has it. Um, Greg well, and Hillary. God and bless I know. you. But I have it. <laughs> it it I, is. I have a little story to tell on Greg Marks. Uh oh. Okay. Um, Good. When 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 <laughs> I got pregnant, they on the show, they decided not to show my pregnancy, and so it was. Um, and and Greg, when did you come on the show? What was the year? Uh, 84. November. 84? October. October. Okay. October 84. About to be 80. Okay. So I bet to be 84. And I got pregnant about um, six months later. And so we they were they were really working this romance and everything else. And we had all these bed scenes. And um, so <laughs> I'm in this little black teddy. And, you know, I'm supposed to be seducing him and I've got this belly on me. And I remember they just shot me from the back the whole time. They just kept shooting me from the back. As I got bigger, they were more determined that we were going to have these love scenes. <laughs> and finally, one day we're in bed and we're supposed to, and he goes, now I want you to roll over on top of her and Greg just goes, have you seen her? <laughs> you come here and try and roll over on top of me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Daytime soaps. I love it. Here's a little Daytime. historical tidbit, too, I have about Greg Marks. My grandfather was Whitey Main, David Whitey Main. And he was a manager of Vaudeville acts, including Mae West. He was also the uh, chief booking agent of the Keith Albee Vaudeville circuit and worked with your grandfather. You're kidding. Isn't that amazing? Did I, I didn't uh, know that, I don't think. I think we talked about it once maybe, or I and, and or maybe I found out about it later. And I was like, cause I meant mentioning you to my mother and she was like, oh, well, and then she told me the whole story. It's well, like, well, well amazing. Amazing. since we're talking about your grandfather, why don't you talk about yes, the Marx Brothers? <laughs> uh, um, what do you remember? I remember mostly, I used to spend time uh, with my grandfather um, and the brothers all lived down in Palm Springs. Maybe that's why I'm moving to Palm Springs. Oh Maybe. my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I used to spend time with them around the holidays and, and they were just my uncles and my grandfathers, you know, so it wasn't really, um, I just remember feeling very special when I was with them. Um, but I was really close to my grandfather and fairly close to Harpo, hardly knew Groucho at all. Um, he was sort of in a different stratosphere in a certain way. Um, and then I, and you know, I spent, I mean, Hillary knows this and Scott may too. I spent a long time trying to um, integrate the Marx legacy into my persona instead of feeling, um, like I had to live up to something, you know? <clears throat> so it took, it took a long time. In the last few years, I've had time to reflect on them and it's a pretty great legacy to have. Um, but it, it took a long time for me to not feel like I had to measure up in some, in some capacity to that. I literally had a casting director one time, very early on. Um, I was thinking about what Scott was saying about that audition that you had uh, where you were kind of like, can I say that or should I do that? And I literally had a casting director. It was for some kind of a nighttime sitcom. And um, 
before we got in, I sat, came into the room and, and it was a guy, I don't even remember who it was. I said, oh, you're a, you're a Marx. Okay, be funny. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Just like that. And that's the down, that's the pitfalls of having, you know. Right. It opens doors, but it also raises expectations. And, and I didn't know enough about myself. I didn't have enough confidence to say, um, I'll talk to somebody else or I'll come back or that was in a, that was inappropriate. Call my agent, cut a deal. I'll be funny. Exactly. <laughs> You're right. You're the right Put price. this on the table. <laughs> Put this on the table. I wish, right. I wish I had had the foresight, the foresight to, um, to make that into, into a moment. Cause it could have been, uh, yeah. instead, of, instead of kind of going, Oh, okay. <laughs> You know. uh, but you never you never do the first time. It's such a uh, putting. No. When, you, when you move it, to it Palm Springs, when you move you to Palm Springs, I will introduce you to my very close friend Lucy Arnez, and you oh, will have a similar. She had the similar thing. I mean, her mom right. Lucille Ball, and that was both a, a you know a open doors and a curse. And she's remarkable, yeah. and she lives in Palm Springs. I really would love, love to meet her. I didn't know she lived down there. Yeah, I'll hook you guys up. Great. Did you see her on the Will and Grace my, episode? My daughter was in. No, was she great? She, yeah, she 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 was in the. They did recreated the chocolate scene, and she oh. played like the, the manager, Lucy Arnaz. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was Grace and and uh, right, doing Karen the, doing right, it, right. but she was she was the boss. So hilarious! Was, hilarious! Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was great. Greg, speaking about uh, parents, because we talked about Annie Sword. Talk about your on-screen parents, Don Hastings and Eileen Fulton. Uh, two, two more of my favorite people. Um, uh, Eileen, you can't describe Eileen. I mean, <laughs> she is the most unique person I've met, and and I I love. She's uh, Lisa. She's really Lisa. She is. Yeah. She you is. know, for people, you know, you say you can't describe, but she is Lisa in a large way in a large way and sort of off the wall and all just you kind of never know where she is um but you want to be there <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> like, where are you? Where um i i adore her and um we became we we stayed friends i haven't talked to her in a long long time but I, when i would go back to new york to visit or to uh hang out for a while i would always have dinner with her and uh and Don, I mean, he was just like everybody's dad, you know? I mean, he was just like the dad. Um, and one of the funniest people we've ever met. And, and one of the funniest people. And one of the Until the camera came on. People. Right. Yeah, well, then he when the camera popular. came on, he was like. Dr. Bob. <laughs> and and Dr. Bob. That's, that's really true. Um, but, but I. Uh, the thing, and I've thought a lot about this over the years, it was very much a family. Um, and not just the the Hugheses and this and you know and the Montgomerys and so forth. It was it was really a family. Um and those relationships, many of them have sustained, you know. Um testament right here. Absolutely. When when you told me these guys were doing it, I'm like, okay, I'm there, you know. So that's yeah. awesome. You know, it's interesting also in those days too, people don't know it now because they don't work the hours that we did. We worked ridiculous hours. We would be from seven in the morning and often 9 30, 10 30, 11 midnight, and then come back the next day. So we were spending more time with our TV families than we did with That's our children. That's true. Hillary, I just wondered, I don't think I've ever asked you this. Do you remember when you early on Hillary moved to a farm? Um, and she, uh, she was telling me about her time on the farm and we got ducks and we got cows and we got lambs and whatever. And so she got these two little lambs, yin and yang. And then, and I thought, oh, how cute. And she showed me pictures. Months later, Hillary comes in, we're, at, we're in rehearsal in the morning. I should, probably shouldn't say this. And, and I said, how was your weekend? And she said, well, we had yin and yang for dinner. And I said, uh, you mean you had them over for dinner? 
Uh, she said, no, we had them for dinner. I said, okay. It was a working uh, farm. It's a working farm. What can I, I have to kiss you in this scene. That is really scary. You you ate these pets that you had that you named, but I, I'm not a farm kid, so it's why farmers use numbers, not names. Oh my god. <laughs> well, we started out with with Millicent <laughs> and um and Vinny, who was the ram, and um Millicent and and then there was Liz. She she kind of bossed them all around, and then there were the two that I couldn't tell apart, so they were Cheech and Chong. <laughs> and one of them had twins and we called them yin and yang. And we had to, that was how we kept it. It was Easter. <laughs> <laughs> you were hungry. <laughs> oh that was part of what made me a vegetarian, I have to tell you. We didn't, we didn't keep the farm long, I'm telling you right now. We did not keep the farm long because it was like, okay, uh, this, this is for a lot of a, a more sturdy person than I am. It's My work. Piece That's serious work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and you had a few other careers going. Speaking of other careers, Greg, how, the voiceovers. My daughter to this day would listen to Greg when she was a little girl, and Greg would leave a message on the answering machine. She'd just sit by the phone and listen to his message. I love his voice, mommy. I love his voice, and she could pick you out in any commercial that you did on voiceovers. No, you're kidding. Yeah, that's Greg. I could tell that's Greg. Wow. Yeah. So talk, a, talk about that, Greg. I'd like to be your agent now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love it. Uh, in what way, Alan? Just to, the, you, you've, you've just been doing it for 40 plus years, doing voiceover work. Yeah, you know? a really long time. In fact, uh, yeah, really long time. And some, you know, raw stress for less. Oh, I was going to actually ask the fans to tell me some of the things if they recognized your voice. So that if there was... are actually, you know, if anybody's listening, uh, write up, you know, where you've heard Greg's voice so we can uh, see if you're correct. Um, well, Hillary and Greg, um, I, I know a lot of fans want to know Margot and Tom losing the baby broke so many people's hearts. Um, some fans uh, think it was this rumored clause that Eileen had in her contract, which, you know, I don't believe that was the case, but, you know, what was that like for the two of you? Hill, do you want to go first? Uh, you know, it was very interesting because I, um, I can't remember now whether I was still pregnant or I just had had Courtney. I think I was still pregnant. I, I, that's what I think. That's how they sent me off in maternity leave, wasn't it? That I was still pregnant. Um, that I and I lost the baby. And um, I, it, first of all, I, I felt so badly for Eileen because she got a lot, a lot of uh, hate mail. Right. Yeah. And it was a clause that she had had years ago in her contract. She didn't have it when she came back. And and it was if you got made a grandmother on 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 a soap opera, then you no You're longer done. have a story. Mm-hmm. It wasn't that she didn't want grandchildren to be part of it. She just didn't want to be put in the category where suddenly she disappeared into the kitchen and you never saw her again. So that's what that was. And that was a previous contract, you know, whatever. Um, so it wasn't in her contract. There was no clause. Um, they just didn't like to deal with children because there were all kinds of union rules and doubles. And it's very complicated when you do it anyway. Um, that time, I think I went into the cave to go, uh, or or I know what it was. Stein, Steinbeck had put me in a cave. Steinbeck, yeah, Steinbeck, yeah, right, yeah. And um, I just remember that I was in the cave and um, basically losing the baby and acting it. And I, they came out over the talk back and they said, um. Not so real. It's it's really uncomfortable to watch. <laughs> oh god! <laughs> like, can you be not as good? Have this on <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe we shouldn't have told this story. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is not the way to do this. But um, I, always, I always remember that as being you know it just it's it's really uncomfortable real. to watch. Too real. Too real. Too real. Wow. Yeah. What do you remember from it, Greg? Uh, 
I remember uh, it was a story that touched me so deeply. Um, <clears throat> you know, as an actor, sometimes you you have to really work to find your connection to what's going on, especially if it's really emotional. And um, for some reason, it just hit me where I live. Um, and it was it was instantaneous. Part of it, I think, was the great writing. Part of it was just my my sensibilities. But I remember it was like, just Greg, just get out of the way because it's happening. You don't even have to work. You just have to just show up. Yeah. The problem was I was very far along. I was. Um, yeah. I personally was like eight and a half months pregnant, but they had Margot as being. I think Five seven, and a half, yeah, six, yeah, months, six or right. seven months pregnant at the time. So it was, you know, it was quite, and, and people were angry that it wasn't made a viable, uh, you know, that, that they hadn't allowed it to be a viable birth that, you know, and then why didn't we have a funeral? Mm. That was the oh, other wow. thing I got in the mail was that she was so far along, she should have named it and had uh, a funeral. Wow. We're, just we're lucky. Really interesting reactions all around from the fans because they were so invested in Tom and Margot. Right. And this was their baby. And it was, you know, it was just a. Yeah, they're commenting now how horrible it was to watch. But just think about it, if there was social media, you were reading letters months later. Because right. <laughs> right. the response would have been the, the powers that be would have heard a lot about that at that I'm time. I'm grateful we didn't have social media back in my day. I, I really am. Really. Know. It would be really brutal. <laughs> I remember back in those days, Scott, I remember Doug Marlin would come in with all the powers that be, the P&G people and the network people, and he'd sit down and he would explain the story that he had for the next year. That's right. That would be, he had the big story. The yeah, this Bible. Yeah. The Bible. Yeah. The Bible. And he had the Bible and he told about what the story was going to tell the next year. And he had the offshoots of story. Those are the ones they said, okay, you don't have to you know, map out so much. But what was so interesting with him was that he had a braid. He always, as this story was going this way, this story was going this way, another story was coming up. And each story being a different color would So you always had something that was peaking. And and that's that was his brilliance. But again, so the story was mapped out. It had a ten. It, it was flushed and it was full and it was solid and it was. Um, and then when they gave the thumbs up, they stuck with it. Had you had social media back then, one person may not have liked something. They would have changed course. Yeah, and the, you know, the have had stories the back then that you told, there were oh my god, from you know every character had such. I was just thinking in my head, wouldn't it be amazing if the estate of Doug Marlin like you know, could have published these, uh, you know, just for fans to read. It would have been it's, fascinating. Actually, it's a really cool idea. You know? It's a real, you know, fascinating. the Bible was real. It really existed. And, yeah. Then, yeah. You know, and then if you were, you know, lucky enough to have dinner at the house and literally the limo would be sent for you. And here's your layout for your character arc for like the next six months. It'd be amazing. And they have some sneak peeks for a year from now. And then how it was interwoven with each of these people, each of these characters, and again, not from plot, but from passion. Yeah. And and it, and it really, boy, those were amazing days. Yeah. Well, I was watching so much clips of all of you, and just the the entire, you know, Liz and Martha and and Finn and 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 um, Brian Bloom and and Julianne and Marissa and Kevin um, Stephen Weber. I mean, it's your canvas, your canvas at that time. Tamara and and Michael, you know, all of it. Uh, it, it. It was an incredible time on that show, really. Um, and speaking of Liz uh, Scott, people would absolutely kill me before we got off this show if I didn't ask about working with La, La Hubbard. Liz and, Hubbard uh, taught me how to do the medium. Um, there is no one alive who can chew scenery with such power and grace and believability. Yep. There is no over the top for Liz Hubbard. And so when you work with her, strap your seatbelts on and get ready to go for the ride. And and you're not in charge. So you got to kind of go where it goes. But she is an extraordinary, extraordinary talent and extraordinary woman. And I, I adored it. And when we had our 
you know, there was a period of time when the scripts were kind of getting kind of vague with us. And they were, we were on, there are times where you feel like you're on, uh, like you're circling the airport, your characters, you know, you keep, you know, I'm here at the hospital having coffee. I don't know why. You know, just like, <laughs> right. And we're just kind of hovering. And Liz and I go, said, we're here working at the office late at night. Let's, you know, and my dad always said, when in doubt, play sex. So Liz and I start doing it and we get called up to the office and there's Bob Calhoun and P&G people and Ed Trock, and they go, we know what you're doing. Stop. Stop. <laughs> so we stopped. And about maybe a week and a half later, we were brought back up to the office and we were told, um, reaction's been quite positive. Please put it back in. And we were, and we were off. And then we were like, okay. And so it was all, it was all heat, all romance. And then I had the affair with her before right. I go rescue Here's a great little inside joke from Doug Marlin. Before you go rescue Sierra, right? Right. And that, yeah. and just how Doug Marlin wrote little secrets to the actors inside the script, I just have to share. There's a moment when I met Sierra. Sierra was dressed as a young boy named Carlos. And so he was. she was pretending to be a young boy. And I'm asking for this young boy's help to find this girl. And we're just together all the time. And a, a huge blast comes in. There's civil war going on. And this bomb comes in through the hotel windows. And I have to get on top of her and him and protect from the shrapnel. And in the parentheses, it says, Craig is strangely drawn to Carlos. <laughs> 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 now, that was for nobody's benefit but mine, right? But that would be like a little love note from Doug Marlin to make you laugh. But, you I know, have a, I have a little story in, about in, Liz Mon in, in Montego. <laughs> yes. Montego. I have a little story about Liz Hubbard when we were on the doctors because we were on the doctors together. Yeah. And um, David O'Brien used to sit in front of the monitor and watch her and go, "Watch, come here, come here, come here, watch her, watch her. She's fascinating when she has nothing, nothing. to say. Just, just wow. watch. It's like." Somebody has farted in the room, and by the end of the scene, she's going to figure out who. <laughs> and if you watch her, she would do this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was it, it was riveting, and we all would gather to watch Liz Hubbard not say anything. She could win an Emmy reading the phone book. That is I mean, extraordinary. Yeah. And, and and did you ad lib a lot? Oh, with Liz? Oh, the the, <laughs> the script was a vague reference point. <laughs> there were some bullet points we have to get to in this script, but and that was kind of my job was to make sure that that one little plot point got out before the commercial break. But you know, yeah, you kind of went for the ride, and yet it was so riveting, so real, and so funny. I mean, she could be that that high society nonsense that she could play that was so funny. Her her relationships with her butler, her relationships with her daughter, her her relationships at anything that she that Liz does as an actress is the the passion is on 110. It's yeah. like and it's I'll watch her do anything. She's extraordinary. But what's amazing to me about her is that she knows instinctively, I think. It never goes over that line into caricature ever. She's always real. She's just always this real. side of it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. Should we say she chews the scenery with a knife and a fork? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. With, yes. With grace. With grace. Truly. Truly. Yes. She's but a brilliant actress. Brilliant. Yeah. I brilliant. couldn't agree. Couldn't agree more. There Hillary, were lot, there. There were a lot of really. T unbelievably talented people on that set. Len Berkman, who was the uh, director of Smith College, he, he ran the uh, drama program up there. He would bring students into our tour of the studio for years. He did this at, as the world turns. And he called us the Royal Shakespeare Company of Soap Opera. Wow. And he said the caliber of talent on the show is sure. unmatched. And, you know, you're looking at like, you know, Larry Brigman, <laughs> Larry Brigman, great Larry Brigman story. Who, another guy I learned from so much, you know, his close-up, sometimes the show would be a little short and, and you get this long, lingering, slow close-up into your face. And I'm watching Larry and he holds it for like a minute and a half before it goes to black. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you thinking? And he goes, I'm trying to remember if I left the gas on. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, that's so, 
It's like, right. I'm not, I, right? And then right. one time I was complaining with the director of the day, it was a Friday, and I had this line, it was the same line. And I said to him, I said to the director, I said this line on Monday, I said it on Tuesday, I said it on Wednesday, I said it on Thursday, why am I saying it again today? And Larry Brigman's in the back of the rehearsal hall, he goes, because our audience is at home doing this. <laughs> <laughs> It's like perspective, you know. I know that could um, discover a dead body behind his couch one day, and the next day they decided they didn't want to go down that road with the dead body, so they just didn't drop the story. <laughs> right, that was it. And he just carried on. So right. just never didn't. I would have been. How can you expect me to work like this? I can't. And he's just like. Eh. Well, no, if you remember Mary Linda Ratliff, the wonderful actress who played my aunt yeah. Maggie who uh, went to the bathroom at the hayloft, never to return, and no one ever yeah. mentioned her again. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes- Went that's up there, and that was that. That's that's that. <laughs> yeah, you go up. I mean, didn't come back. Tommy, up there. Um, character Tommy on, on Days of Our Lives went up to his room, never came down. Never right? came down. Never came or down. my dad's day on, as, on Guiding Light, uh, his son went up the room, uh, went upstairs on Friday, and he was seven, and on Monday he came down a lawyer. <laughs> so. <And> there it is. <laughs> That's how life yeah. is, right? Real life. Well, I, frankly, it feels that way. <laughs> that happened. So, yeah. you realize that we were only overlapping for two years on As the World Turns? Yeah. That's all. Uh, that's all you did. You did one contract. Yeah. I think I ruined you for daytime. Is that what I did? did you I ruined me for everything, darling. <laughs> for everything. <laughs> but, I mean, think of the memories that we have pulled in just in those two years yeah is, is it true hillary that when um uh, i think it was roscoe or someone left one life to live you called greg and said thomas christopher Hughes, you need to come to land view and play with me somebody i i, I read that um that absolutely i might have <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely true and believe me there have been more than one occasion where I, I, beg. I literally was on I was on my knees at one point in Lincoln Center outside on the phone to Scott going, please, please come play with me, please. And I thought I almost had him hooked. And he was like, you, I just can't. You, you even called me you and Catherine Hicklin uh, um, team tag team me. And we're like, you have to come. You have to come. And I was like, you know, I should have, could have, would have. Uh, it would have been very interesting and probably a wonderful experience, but it would have been, it could have been all I could say is in a parallel universe. It's happening right now. Yeah, right. I know. But I yeah, was standing there, and you know, they have that climbing wall at Lincoln center yeah. and I was standing there looking at the climbing wall, talking to, to Greg. And I was like, just put one foot on a peg at a time. Just walk him up the wall. <laughs> Well, almost. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it really those two. It is years, amazing, though. That's two years. Two years that you you know create such an incredible bond. It was well for. It was a magical time for me, and it was um, again with Hillary. It was the most obvious, but it, it happened with Scott. It happened with a lot of people there. But Hillary and I, because we had so much work together, and it was so instantaneous. It was so organic that it was, I didn't know how blessed I was at the time. I had no idea, wow. truly. I did, I knew. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. Um, <clears throat> I did not know how magical it was until I went back and came and it was like, oh my God, you know, it was, yeah. it was an extraordinary time. Yeah, really exciting. And you know, it's often, it's it, character changes like that from very popular, strong characters in the show take a long time. And Greg, you were seamless. And the audience accepted you instantly as, yeah. you know what I mean? It was pretty yeah. amazing. Well, I paid them They were very big shoes to fill. I mean, Justin D is yeah. a phenomenal yeah. actor and you just stepped yeah. in and made, and, and you know. And made it your own. You didn't try to, right. And you did that right away and you did it with confidence. And right right out of the gate. Right, right out, out of the gate. gate. <clears throat> So, yeah. Bravo. I have to brag a little on Scott Bryce. Um, I've had the pleasure of not only directing him, but producing him. Yeah. Um, in the season, this series called Beacon Hill. Yeah. Um, and 
I have enjoyed doing this because I get to watch my peers uh, from a completely different perspective. And um, I watch them, I get to watch them work, which you don't really do when you're in it. with them, when you're right. in it, you're just, you just are and you're being and you're feeling and reacting. But when you get to step outside and you're on the other side of the camera and you get to watch your actors work, uh, it, it, it's, it fills you with such pride. And Scott filled me with such joy and pride. And there's this scene that is um, actually was brilliantly lit where half his face is in light and the other half is in really craggy dark. And he's being adamant with his daughter and just friggin' making every pore on your face and every whole sphincter sees because he's <laughs> being so scary. And I am, I, I just went up and whispered in his ear one note and I said, this is a 2% note. Just remember the journey of getting there or something like that. I can't, I don't even remember what I said. It was very brief and it was, it was so much fun to watch what he did with that note. He took it to a whole different playing field than, and it was, he, he's just a breath of fresh air to work with on the set anyway, because he's just a joy. But to then have him take on this character that is really uh, very driven and um, warmth is not the first place they go to, <laughs> to watch him really just hone in and focus and pull and do, it was, Scott, I have to tell you, it was magical. I just oh, was so it. grateful for the opportunity. And I needed to, um, to share that with you in a forum that's a little bit more public than just you and I. Well, oh, I can also awesome. tell you that, you know, when you, when you have a director, you know, you can get a lengthy notes and somebody can talk to you for 10 minutes or somebody can walk up to you and give you the exact right two words. And that's what you did. And yeah. so, you know, sure, I delivered from the note, but the note was exact. I knew exactly what you meant. And then I could make that adjustment. And uh, and it worked. It, oh my it God. really worked. We all had goose, goosebumps. And I mean, I had tear. I mean, it literally, I mean. No, the makeup girl came out to do right before my second, just the second safety shot. And she's like weeping. And then other people were weeping. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I said, what's going on? And they said, anybody who's got daddy issues, you're going to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really, I mean, it was also a really um, uh, pertinent. It's a, you know, a, most of my work post soaps have been with for the LBGT community. And, um so it was really uh happy, very, happy pride what i said happy pride it's pride Thank month you. yeah exactly. <laughs> um yeah and happy juneteenth everybody yes, happy, happy juneteenth, juneteenth. Happy correct 100 percent. happy um, juneteenth. so it was really uh it, it was it hit home that scene to a lot of people on the set i was honored to be there and work with you for you hillary truly and I I you know i love you i could just get greg to come and play <laughs> maybe we can we'll have to create a part um, oh, oh, we had one. <laughs> I reached out. <laughs> I, uh, I, I believe yeah. Hillary. I, I'm sure she has tried many times. I reach um, out all the time. They take Hillary, very good care of you, Greg. I got to tell you, it was class A all the way. So <laughs> <laughs> I was watching some great stuff between you and Colleen, uh, Hillary. Um, there's a there's a scene where um, you said you better leave now before I give you a black eye. I'm going to tell the manufacturer how simply, simply Barbara really is, <laughs> and I have to get out of, and I and I have to get out of here before I throw up all over you. <laughs> I was having a, I was having a ball. Were you, did you have fun with, you know, the animosity between you and Colleen? Well, you know what was really interesting was that you know I, I was there prior to her when she was a victim, mm -hmm. and then. Gre then you know Doug came in and changed her to be a villain, yeah. and it was so interesting because it kind of pivoted around the Tom and Margot story because she was with Tom. No, yeah. she was married to to James. James. To James. And yeah. I was the stable girl. My character was the stable girl and slept with him. So I was really the bad girl to victim Barbara, and then. When victim Barbara changed her mind, she was because she wanted 
That and one became Vixen Barbara. Vixen Barbara. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I watched her throw herself on top of Greg, like pretending that she was so her. It was, Colleen was, <laughs> it was very, very funny to watch. I, you know, I think that role was more fun for Colleen to play than Victim Barbara. Absolutely. And, uh, but she was scared because she was like, you know, she, she had a very nice place in the show. But I think it just elevated to new proportions when she did that turn. It was so great. And I said, look, you get to wear much better outfits. Did <laughs> 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 you have fun of- with that, Greg? I mean, the fans must have, I mean, again, social media would have would have skinned her alive if uh, for sleeping with Tom. I can only imagine. Um, and I think because there wasn't social media until we went out to the mall in Ohio or, you know, saw or fans would write us, we wouldn't have that instant feedback. And in a way it was good because it didn't change everything based on somebody's opinion. It, we we told the story. You committed, you really committed to this. Yeah. You, You let it play out in real, you know, just let it go. And what it showed me, because until that point, I was not really aware of how invested the audience was in Tom and Marco. I really didn't, I did not have the sense of how deeply committed they, they were to us being together. Until you, know? you went out in public to, to a fan event. Uh, that, that was, um, it, it, it was much more clear to me at that point. Yeah. You know that that uh, because we didn't have that instant feedback that you have now, and uh, I'm kind of grateful because we were in our own little bubble in a way. Also, it's- daytime daytime fans, it's very specific. I know how you know me. Like if you know me from a feature film, they stand across the street and kind of point. If they know you from prime time, they approach you very respectfully. Hello, how do you do? I saw you on Chicago PD. You were right. If they know you from daytime, it's like, hey, what's up? <laughs> you know, the chair. because it's every day in their right. living room right and sometimes there's so there's no boundaries and like we become part of their family yes yeah. and so the response to that when something happens between tom and margo that they don't like boy you're going to hear about it like you would from your own family it's a very it's different true. thing that it's so cool true. I, i've never heard it described that way i mean i know the daytime fans and the five day a week thing but hearing it for like a movie or a prime time show. Yeah, very different. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I remember getting a letter saying from a woman saying, I like you better than I like my daughter. You come to see me every day, and she doesn't. Ooh, ow. 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 Right. And and wow. Like, wow. Wow. But, you know, there you go. I was wow. in her house an hour every day. And, and, and you, were, you were bringing her comfort, clearly. That's and as, you, as you discussed earlier, Alan, like it was daytime that helped your mother learn to speak English. Correct. Yeah. You know, oh, and that's, please, please tell the James Brady story. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, James Brady was Secretary James Brady uh, under Ronald Reagan when the assassination attempt happened on Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan was shot, but uh, survived. And James Brady was horribly injured and took a headshot. And it uh, affected his speech dramatically. He couldn't walk uh, for quite a long time. I'm not sure if he ever did. And when he was in rehab and it was obvious he was going to survive, he needed to relearn how to speak. And he did it by watching As the World Turns. And and As the World Turns was like his rehab. And he became a fan of the show and particularly of mine, which was so nice. And he requested to come visit. And so he and his wife came to CBS Broadcast Center and watched the show and I got to have lunch with them and I, I said, you know, how, how did As the World Turns help you learn how to speak? And he said, well, you guys always repeat everything. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next, the next year he came back and this time he brought with him many congressmen and senators, literally. There were these politicians and secret service around and they're all lined up watching. It was my son's birthday and my and, and Sierra was thought dead. And so everybody, the entire company's there. And I stepped away and I'm watching this line of actors looking at all the congressmen and the senators and this line of senators and congressmen looking at all the actors. And I thought the caption would be, I could do that. Yeah. It, was this, <laughs> it was this amazing oh, moment. 
But there you have it where I thought, isn't that I fascinating so. that a daytime soap helped teach your mother how to speak English, God knows how many immigrants to speak English, and how many people got helped in rehab. So, I mean, it was a profound kind of feeling, I thought. That wow. is. I never heard that. That's amazing. Amazing. I, I uh, didn't either. I love that story so, so much. Um, we, we have to talk about some of the famous folks that we were talking about, and also, uh, Scott, some of your loves which include Meg Ryan and, and Finn and Lindsay. Can you share what it was like and working with dozens them? dozens more. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I, you know, tough job. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, again, as, I, as, as Greg and I have already mentioned over and over, I really was clueless as to how fortunate I was. In working with Meg, she was so quirky at the time that, yeah, but I could see it. I remember Don Hastings go, she's got no training. And I said to him, she's going to be huge. <laughs> and we kind of knew. And there, and she was. But, you know, we worked with Marissa Tomei, who was so amazing, and Julianne Moore, and yeah, Stephen Weber. And there's so many people who, Bill Fickner, endless of, of remarkable talent that we got to work with and share with and be with and learn from. and and uh, oftentimes make out with or do bed scenes with, you know. But I, I have to tell people, because people say, what's it like to like be in bed with Go a beautiful woman? Camera. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> so I said, then what's it like to be in bed with a beautiful actress? And I go, you have to understand that when you're doing a soap opera, this is incredibly intimate love scene. Two feet away from you, there's a techie with a gut out to here. He's reading the New York Post, <laughs> you know? And there's like 50 members of the crew who've seen this a thousand times. And and so we create that intimacy, but it's not real. And now I don't know if I've heard this. I read this uh, in Hollywood Reporter, I think, that Bold and the Beautiful has gone back on the air. And that one of the ways that they're going to be doing love scenes, folks, are you ready? Greg, please. <laughs> Greg, Greg read the same thing, <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> so they're going to be using blow-up dolls. <laughs> and I thought, I'm sorry. I'm a good actor, but I don't think I could ever pull that off. I don't think I could keep a straight face. <laughs> I read the same. I read the same thing, and I was just like, "What? What? Really? <laughs> so do yeah. Do, this. do not do this to daytime. We do are not do this. Not it's hanging on by a thread. Don't die. I worked, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I worked with one or two actors that had about the emotional range of a blow up. Oh, yes, blow. yes. But <laughs> they weren't real blow. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do this. I just, oh my God. Is that what the news was this morning? Because I, Nip's like, hey, they're talking about Bold and the Beautiful. I think they're back on or something. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, they, start, they started yesterday, but he said there was an article that, that said- uh, It was like a couple of days ago. Yeah, that yeah. the deal was you could either use your significant other to be the stand-in or a blow-up doll. Hmm. So I guess, it, you know, it does your significant other, is it good casting? Because <laughs> if it's not, we're going with the blow up doll. <laughs> just, yeah. The oh, blow up doll is much more realistic. I don't know. Oh. You, you three certainly like to laugh. Is, is there uh, something you remember from World Turns that you know you couldn't get through because of one of these three all the time? <laughs> it would happen a lot. I would say this: we would laugh all the way through usually dress rehearsal. But I've got to tell you, when that slate went up, these actors that I get to work with, you're looking into the eyeballs of that character, mm -hmm. not the actor. And we would do the scene to our utmost with absolute respect and giving 110% to each other. We were really there for each other. There was. And there's no cue cards and there's no nothing that it was real contact. And then as soon as they would say clear, oh my God, we're off to the races again. And yeah. that was part of the great joy of it, that I could be laughing one moment and then have to tell Sierra that I'm sterile with tears streaming down my face and that, you know, <laughs> in set like that. And, and, yeah. and then the scene's over and then go laugh again and go play, you know, what, what did we used to play all the, the, the card game we played? Oh, Uno. Uno. We played Uno constantly. And then Hillary and I, I don't know if you know this, but in makeup in the mornings, we used to love to watch, what's the show? $10,000 Pyramid? $100,000 Pyramid? And we would turn the volume off and we'd, we'd swap chairs and be like, who was the giver? Who, right? 
And we got really good at it, so good at it, that actually CBS had us come out. And, I love that. And we did amazing together. We won $40,500 for our charity. Yes. Amazing. Wow. And I can tell you right now what word it was. Do you remember what charity, too? I, the, the, here's the clue. Conestoga Wagon. Things a pioneer uses. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Greatest clue ever from her. <laughs> <laughs> you remember what the charity was that you donated to? I did Big Brothers of New York and uh, um, New York City, and Hillary did the American uh, Native American College Fund. The believe. American Indian College, Indian College Fund. Fund. Mm. Annie Swords, uh, baby, and I always wore an Indian. I had an Indian piece on me each show. Wow, that is yeah, great story. Right. Um, was Benjamin Hendrickson one of the biggest pranksters on set? Benjamin. Probably the biggest. Benjamin. 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 Loving you, meaning yeah. it. Meaning it. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin was one, a dear friend um, I, uh, and a tortured soul. And his demons got him in the end. And that's, uh, it was heartbreaking. But I have incredible memories of laughing with Benjamin all the time. He was truly, truly funny. Mm. Yes, indeed. And oh, it's, yeah. And in the, and the, and the kind totally. of genius comic sense that, you know, there's that saying that most genius comics carry great pain. And I, mm. I think and I think he was testament to that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I hate to do this. I love you all, but I have to run. Please continue on with yourselves. I'm sorry. I, I, that, that's OK. Thank you I so love much you, Hillary. For I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for having me, Alan. And thank you for bringing us together. I just, you got it. I, I won't keep them much longer, but thank you so much for doing this, Hillary. Yeah, not just say nice things about me when I love you. Now we can talk about it. <laughs> the truth comes out. I love you, my sister. I love you. I sister. love you. Bye, guys. Bye, right, bye. Bye. Thanks so much. Hey, Greg, can you talk about the supper club that you created? Oh, um, well, a lot of what I've been doing since I left the show has been um, the voiceover stuff. But I also sort of discovered singing, uh, which very late in life, and um, lots of cabaret. Oh, I, I, di I didn't realize it was late in life. Um, before I forget, somebody said, is State Farm something you did? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> they do my insurance. <laughs> maybe I'll have to call them and say, hey, someone thinks I should be doing your commercials. Yeah, but continue um, about the singing. I didn't realize it was late in life because I, I almost asked earlier if you and Eileen ever did a cabaret together. I, but I, I will tell you a story. Years and years and years ago, way before I was on As the World Turns, uh, there used to be a place called The Back Lot in Los Angeles. It was uh, behind Studio One, and it was like a cabaret club. And uh, someone invited me to come see uh, some soap opera diva doing a show. And it was Eileen. And it was, mm -hmm. I had no idea that that was my mother I was watching. <laughs> <laughs> really, it was, it was amazing. Um, but no, I singing was something... I always wanted to do, I dreamt, I used to have dreams of singing. My voice changed early and all of a sudden I couldn't really, I didn't get into the glee club in seventh grade. And I kid you not, it was like a devastating blow and I put it away and I said, I'm not doing that. Um, being the sensitive person that I am. Um, and years, but, but it kept, I kept just, I was taking my whole time in New York. I studied voice um, with an amazing lady named Adrian Angel, um, uh, who was also a Bernadette Peters uh, coach and crazy, wild, nutty lady, but she really knew what she was doing. But I just kept studying it just for my own edification and never really took it out into the world. And then finally, after a couple of years back here, I finally started braving it because it was the, it was the thing I wanted to do the most, so it was the thing that was the most terrifying uh, in terms of how people would respond. Um, but I, I, I just kept doing it and doing it. And I actually, my first show was at the old Cinegrill in the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel um, uh, and uh, continued to do it. And so recently, about 
a year or so ago, I started this thing. I had this idea to do a, an, a really sort of dressy, classy evening based on the old... Um, 1920s? Well, the 30s and 30s, 40s. 40s. Okay. 20s to the 40s, the old Hollywood uh, and New York, but Hollywood uh, supper clubs. That's uh, amazing. And uh, we, we did a number of them at a couple of venues here. And then, damn COVID, you know, it's like, it's like we got to wait because you can't do any yeah. live performances at the moment. But I, it's a, it's a, a um, it's a concept that I was really drawn to because I sing mostly the Great American Songbook, all those old standards anyway. Um, and so my whole idea was, and maybe I will at some point, create that kind of an evening, maybe even open a club. Um, yeah, that's where we fantastic. Have great food, great music, great drinks. Is there a website or where do you, people can find information if it comes uh, back up? Well, not at the moment, because there's nothing going on. Right, uh, right. But, but uh, there isn't a website for that. But there okay. is a greatmark.com, which is uh, would would have any sort of in, you know information. On what is it? What is it called? What? It's it's me, Greg Marks. Dot com. Dot com. Yeah. Oh, great. I, mostly mostly voiceover stuff, but you know, I could post stuff about uh, about the supper club too. Great. Oh my God, and, you're like a magician and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> And Scott, talk about your company. Uh, Stevens Bryce Entertainment, I do with my wife. Uh, it is both educational, corporate, and uh, entertainment. So my wife is a uh, voice teacher and life coach for gifted young performers. She's had several on Broadway, like in Matilda and other shows. So she coaches a lot of those people. She teaches at the uh, New Canaan Conservatory for Performing Arts as well. We have a corporate branch where we do instructions for executive leadership and including uh, going to meetings and doing breakout meetings and team building and also doing uh, training for corporate executives and speaking and presentation. And then we have an entertainment wing where I'm, I've got uh, two films currently in development. One I'm working with very closely with uh, Lindsay Harrison, who wrote it as a very good friends of Hillary Bailey Smith's. It's being produced by Krista Morris. And so we're now fundraising for that. Another thriller that we're working on. And then I've got two scripts I've written, which we can't afford to do because the budgets are too big. So I've got those out and there's really strong interest in one of them, which is a story about a movie uh, star who dies in a crash and a young black uh, special effects guy finishes the scenes overnight and they're perfect. So they hire him to finish the movie. And then the movie starts to get promoted and then the studios get behind it and now he's got to do interviews. So he's doing live interviews from Europe and here's this 22 year old black guy talking like a 38 year old white actor is what they're seeing. But he's speaking what's on his mind and it winds up resonating in America and explodes. It's very much like Meet John Doe. Hmm. Where he, and so this non-existent character winds up running for president of the United States. It's obviously a comedy. So <laughs> we're, we're, do, we're, do, we're doing, we're doing that. Uh, um, so that's kept us really busy. And then I, I keep working. Thank God. I mean, I've, I've been so blessed in my career. I managed to keep our family insured and, you know, we're okay. We we live very well. I, I, Dick Wolf has been particularly good to me. I keep doing those shows and, and often without audition, I get a phone call uh, and an offer. And that's been oh, amazing, that's awesome. and, and that's very rare. And so I'm very that's grateful awesome. to that. So, uh, you know, and like any other actor, I'm convinced that my last job was the last, and I'll never work again. I've been doing that for 45 years, but, you know. And then in terms of voiceovers, I used to do a lot of it. I did books on tape, and as Greg, I think, could tell you that competition for that is now severe, and movie stars are doing the books on tape. So, you know, they can get Tom Hanks to do it. Um, and back in the day, my dad was an announcer. He was the voice of Time Magazine. So every week wow. he did that. And I got to watch what paid for my college, which was one take, Greg. He goes into New York, into the Brill Building, right? Next to oh, yeah. Central, yeah. right? Up we go. He's in blue jeans, a T-shirt. He hasn't shaved. We walk in. I'm with him because I'm going to go meet my godmother after. I was a kid. I was probably like 14, maybe younger. We walk in the booth and, and they go, you want cans, Ed? Meaning headset. And my dad goes, nah. He goes, okay, let's just do it, Ed, all right? <clears throat> my father goes, 
member FDIC. Thanks, Ed. And we left. <laughs> and done. 10,000 10, 10, banks. That's right. yeah. <laughs> and it was like, and I went, huh, maybe there's something to this business. And and it's you know? interesting, the, Br the Brill building is where like the Great American Songbook was written. Yes. Like so Ooh. many, yes. so, it, it's a gorgeous building between gorgeous. 40, 48th and 49th on yep. Broadway. Smash took place, the uh, yep. NBC series yep. Smash took place in there. Yeah. So my last question, you both, played such great characters on World Turns. When when your contract was up, was it a tough decision to stay or go? Uh, who wants to go first? Go ahead. Uh, for me, it was, uh, again, in a ludicrous stroke of fortune, I was virtually able to come and go at will for quite some time. And so they let me do that. And I would go out to LA and I'd work a little bit and then I'd run out of cash and I'd go, hey, can I get it? <laughs> And I'd be back for a year and they'd work my butt off and I'd make a ton of money and I'd go back out. How I got my primetime career started was when I left the show the first time, I got a phone call. Next thing I knew, I was on a plane to Los Angeles to do Facts of Life. And how that happened was all the girls used to watch As the World Turns. So when my character, yeah, left, so my character left, Nancy, George Clooney had just left the show and Nancy McKeon said, bring me Scott Bryce. And then that was my first wedding on TV of like, you know, seven or eight weddings in prime time. Um, so I've been very lucky with that um, and, and, and able to come and go. And then when I did Popular, uh, I got a series, Ryan Murphy's first series called Popular, where I was the, the dad, Mike McQueen. And when we got picked up for the second season, then they recast Craig for the first time. And that was when Hump Block came in and took over because they realized I, I was unlikely to come back. Mm. It's crazy the power of daytime television. I mean, I love that the the girls of Facts of Life were watching. <laughs> yeah. Now crazy. and also remember, daytime television was not respected either no. for a very no. long time, and and uh, which is unfortunate because if you can be good on daytime with no rehearsal and crappy lighting and uh, uh, you know with then you're in a pretty extraordinary actor. So. Well, let you know, I'll, I'll repeat this because it's pretty spectacular that Julianne had returned at the end of World Turns yep. to, yeah. to, to show up. You as, know, an, and, as an homage and to give it honor. Yeah. And I, I was yeah. very, I was, I really respected that of her and it, that she could know, do that. And she's like, yeah, I'm doing that. That's my beginnings. That's where I started. And yeah, I yeah. respect them. It was yeah. great. Yeah, it was really Yeah. Great. And Greg, for you? Uh, well, what happened for me was um, I came, was coming to the end of my contract, and our our wonderful executive producer Bob Calhoun, or Cal as we knew him, um, called me up and he said, uh, um, "I know you're thinking of going back to LA. Um, we really want you to stay, and uh, we're going to hold the role open for about nine months, um, oh, wow. hoping that you change." Your also mind. unheard of. Yeah, kind Correct. of. And, and again, one of those things that I did not really understand what kind of a gift I was being offered. And uh, he said, we, we, you know, stay, um, but go to L.A., see how it feels. And I got to L.A. and I sort of got back into my L.A. groove and I was like, mm, kind of want to stay here. Um, but it was it was an extraordinarily generous Thing that they did because um, they literally gave me almost a year to decide if I wanted yeah. to come back to Oakdale. And um, they well, were that's really that's a testament to him. To Greg. It, it absolutely, yeah, that's amazing. Thank I you. Thanks for say, I, 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 um, I was just flashing on because we were talking about the whole baby losing the baby storyline. Yeah. And not that long ago, I had an occasion to watch. Um, a couple of the scenes that were submitted for uh, the Emmy, and um, and I, it was I think it was two different days of of work, um, and one scene in particular that I remember so vividly. I remember doing it, and I remember the power of watching it was the one with Scotty, where um, we're outside. I had just come out of Margot's hospital room; she's just mm -hmm. lost the baby, and he says, "I mean." I, the guy could cry just asked, just talking about it. He looks at me and he says, how's she? And I said, she's all right. And he says, how are you? And I just 
boom, boom. <laughs> and, and so it was one of my favorite scenes in the entire time I was on that show for a number of reasons, one of which what he said and the way the way you said it and and just that moment was just <laughs> yeah. it was amazing. It was amazing. And then he actually literally because I, I kind of collapse into him and he just kind of holds me. It was it was an amazing moment. What we do you remember about them calling your name? I remember nothing about that. <laughs> it was an out of body experience. I literally because I was sitting at a table, um, you know, and there had been talk that, you know, maybe it's looking good. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had and a good year. I, right, yeah. I've <laughs> never, I've never done what you do, but I hate that talk for you guys. Cause that's, that's awful. That's it's terrible. Right. It's, it's terrible. Awful. <laughs> but I was sitting next to Linda Dano. Oh, the, oh, I love Linda Dano. What a, what a <laughs> and so, you know, I think it was Eric Braden and Eileen Davidson were announcing yep. the winner and uh, blah, 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 blah. And so I hear my name and it doesn't really register. And I looked at Linda Dano to like, cause I didn't want to stand up if I was going to make an ass out of myself. Because it didn't. And she goes, yep. <laughs> from her. And I went, walked up on stage, but it literally felt like it happened to somebody else. Huh. It did not feel, I was not, and I'm not saying that's a good thing. I was not present. able to be present. Um, I, it was, it was an out-of-body experience. It really wow. was. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, before we go, I, I, I want Scott to talk about his son, Jackson. Yes. Yeah, my, my incredible athlete son, Jackson. Uh, yeah, he's an extraordinary guy. Um, he's 13. He's going into ninth grade. He plays for an elite AAU team called High Rise Elite. Uh, he's sponsored by New Balance. So my life has been taking him to sports tournaments for the last literally five years. Because at this point now, he averages like 30 points a game as a shooting guard. It's extraordinary to watch 13, him. 13 and has a sponsor like that? Yeah, yeah. No, he's already on the radar with like several places. He's, thir he's going into ninth grade. And so, you know, my wife is an actress, Broadway actress and singer, standards, a lot of jazz stuff and concerts and me, my, my background. And suddenly we have this sports guy who shows up in our house and is teaching me about the game of basketball and about sports <laughs> and knows all the teams. And the, I'm driving around in all these tournaments. I've entered a life I know nothing about. And after the first season was over, the coach walks over to me and he says, two things, Mr. Bryce, I've got to tell you. You're the only parent who never gives me grief or attitude or tells me how to do my job. And I got to tell you, did, did you teach him that jump shot? And I said, I said, I was tap dancing. I don't really know the game. And so uh, for, for Christmas last year, he bought me basketball for dummies. So, and I get to watch my son do this whole world I know nothing about. He has no interest in the theater. Thank God. And because it's a tough life uh, if that's a calling of yours. Um, and I get to do this other world. He's And he's brilliant and he's charming and he's funny and he has a sense of justice and what's right in the world. And he stands up for the little guy. He, I, I, I burst with pride with him and he teaches me all the time. He it's, sounds just like you. Oh, oh, Greg, that's so sweet. Truly. I guess my check cleared that I sent him. <laughs> because the last one was a little iffy. Venmo, Venmo. Guys, I can't tell you, this has been so much fun. It's so been fun, fun for me, too. Great to see you, Greg. So yeah. great to see you, man. Indeed. Guys, I'll put you backstage for one minute, and then we can talk before we go. Yeah, Thank awesome. you so much right. for doing this. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for watching, too. Thank you all so much. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. I'll see you on Wednesday. Have a good weekend, everybody.